Hello, I'm Stuart Goche, County Agent with the LSU Ag Center, and welcome to Get It Growing with the Lafayette Master Gardeners. Today I have with me my co-host, Janae Foley, who's one of our Master Gardeners, who's real active, especially in our plant propagation area. Um, I think we have one thing we want to start out with is to talk a little bit about our big plant sale we have coming up this Saturday. Right. For those of you who could not get to our plant sale last Saturday, the Lafayette Parish Master Gardeners, after evacuating our plants, did have our originally scheduled sale. We are going to repeat the sale because so many people could not get out this Saturday from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Last Saturday, if you tried to get to the sale, there was a lot of hurricane-related activity at the Blackham Coliseum. There is not any schedule this weekend, but just in case something crops up, instead of using that Coliseum Road exit on the side of Blackburn, try coming in on the Johnson Street entrance to the R. Nelson Center, or you can lose, lose, uh, use St. Landry Street, which runs in front of Lords and continues on through the University of Louisiana property. We still have many, many, many plants left, a good selection of plants, we enjoyed the sale. I really thought it was a nice sale, our, our, our first sale. It was relaxed. We were able to talk with people, answer questions in a relaxed atmosphere without having to feel like we were rushing through their answers. We do have uh, shrubs and trees. We have one of the, the nicer um, fall shrubs is the beautyberry that we talked about on the show. We showed you the pink berries that are really coming into color now. We have Texas firebush, which is a drought tolerant plant, the Cape honeysuckles, the giant kufias. That's all in the shrub and, and tree category and a good cestrum. Um, we also have many, many gingers. If you remember, we talked about lovely gingers that make these huge flower spikes. We have a large selection of those left. We have many perennials in uh, the salvias, fire spike, penstemon, the red husker, and many shrimp plants. We also have many vines available for planting at this time of year. White passion vine, uh, butterfly vine, Dutchman's pipe. So do try and come out. One plant that we didn't mention that we also have a, lot, a nice selection of is this plant called Brazilian red cloak. It's new to our area. You might have seen it discussed in Ann Justice's uh, Gardening in Acadiana column. We expect it to be a real winner of a plant. It's been out in the garden now about four months. We're just anxiously anticipating when it sets buds, but in those four months you can see it's made like a two by two small shrub. This will go up to 15 feet and it's going to have plumes of reddish salvia type blooms at this time of year on into winter. So it should be a real winner of a plant and we have some of these left. We really hope to see you at the plant sale this Saturday from 8 to 1. We're also going to have a few fruit trees and the Master Gardeners had budded some citrus varieties last year and we have some of these trees that will be available. This is a navel orange tree that we have. We grew a rootstock. The rootstock we grew was a uh, swingle and then we had grafted onto it um, some of the class members we grew the trees out and this is a, a navel orange and we have a selection of navels. I think we have a few satsumas and a few grapefruit trees that we'll have available at the sale as well. When we're looking at this citrus tree, I wanted to point out one thing on citrus right now we're getting a lot of calls on at the county agent's office are these crinkled leaves. Uh, we had a lot of rain associated with the, with the hurricane. It's been pretty warm and a lot of the citrus trees have set out a new flush of growth in the last couple weeks. You can see this lighter colored new growth is coming out. And when that new growth comes out, it's an invitation to this little moth called the citrus leaf miner. Lays eggs on that new growth, and the little larva actually tunnels through the leaf, and it causes the leaves to crinkle. Um, this pest, this citrus leaf miner, actually came into the country with Hurricane Andrew, I guess about 12 years ago now. And um, that, that insect, when it first came into the country, they were real worried that it was going to be real devastating to our citrus industry uh, because it really makes the leaves look bad. But what they found out is that really the damage is pretty much cosmetic. It doesn't damage the fruit. It doesn't decrease yields. And so for the most part, as a homeowner, if you can ignore it, it's really not going to um, hurt your tree any. 
Um, a lot of times we get people who bring it in um, kind of after the fact. In the spring, they'll still notice these crinkle leaves. They'll bring it in. They want to know what to spray. Well, it's too late. You ha if you're going to try to do any spraying, you'd have to spray when these flushes of growth are coming out and when the infestation is just taking place. And for the most part, we don't recommend spraying because it's not causing any damage to the tree. If you were to spray, um, you'd have to spray multiple times. You'd really have to have the timing down right. There's, pro there's products like um, spinosad, which is sold as conserve and fertilone bagworm and fruit tree spray. We'll do a pretty good job on it. It's going to take multiple sprays. And unless you're selling trees and you want them to look perfect, or it's a tree in a front yard you want to look perfect, I wouldn't advocate spraying. There's also a little beneficial wasp that if you don't spray, a lot of times will colonize populations of this citrus leaf miner and will keep it under control. So sometimes not spraying is actually even better. Now we also wanted to talk about, we're going to throughout the show talk about hurricane damage. If your citrus tree has taken a, a, a lean, how do you go about getting it back up? Well citrus is remarkably um, um, wind and hurricane tolerant and um, in some cases where the trees have blown over, even if 50 percent, up to 50 percent of the root ball is exposed, you still can um, straighten out that tree, um, plant it back. Maybe you would have to use a cable and a tractor to straighten it out. You might even have to dig out some of the soil so that you can get it just straight. Um, put it back in place, anchor it down. And then once you do that, what they'll recommend doing is actually topping the tree so that it's not, it's not unstable. So you would want to, you can cut up to 50% of, um, of the tree um, to make sure that it's not too top heavy. Then once you get it straightened out and you, you, you have it anchored down, it's really important to water. And if we go a week without rain, especially even this time of year, you need to keep the tree well watered because if that tree had a lot of root damage, and this applies to anything that's blown over in the storm, any tree um, or any plant that you've set back, right? You have to think those roots have been damaged. That plant is not going to be able to tolerate much drought. So probably the most critical thing is to water and to keep it well watered for the next few months. And then once we get into usually November and, and uh, December, water shouldn't be an issue anymore. But we're, right now, we need to keep them watered. OK, and let's talk a little bit, too, because citrus is an exception. Most of your shrubs and perennials, if they've, if they've gone over, you've got, you know, say you've got the little lean like this. The first thing you want to do, just as with the citrus, is get those roots reburied. And if you're having trouble, keep it stable. I've even taken compost and actually gone on, on top just to rebury those roots. But with your shrubs and your perennials, don't prune them back as hard. You can prune them down on the, the side where it's fallen to get some of that weight off to encourage it to come up. But this isn't the time to be giving them a hard pruning. They're going to, they're going to resent it. So you could, you can, prune back maybe a third, but don't go to the 50% that you're doing for your citrus. And the same thing, just water, water, water. And this is not the time either to be fertilizing them. We're, we're, we're too late in the, in the year, so don't try and baby them along and give them, give them fertilizer because that's going to have a rebound. You're going to encourage tender growth. And then when we get cold weather, those trees are going to be more stressed. So just get them upright. Get, get the roots covered and keep them well watered. And it's just going to be survival of the fittest. I want to mention, too, just some personal observations that, that LSU Ag Center has made on some of the, the trees that have been damaged by the, by the hurricane, the citrus. We have a lot of damage to citrus trees, especially down in Plaquemine Parish. Mm -hmm. In Vermilion Parish, we have about 15 acres of citrus. And um, some things we've noticed, uh, one thing, satsumas tend to be a lot more um, seem to be a lot more hurricane tolerant. Um, the fruit are a little smaller, and um, they held on the trees a lot better. Whereas some of the larger fruited varieties like navel, they tend to drop their fruit pretty readily with the hurricane. Um, the other thing on these satsumas and talking with our specialists, even though they've held on the tree, you can expect that when you go to harvest them, there's going to be a lot of scarring on the fruit. And um, what they're thinking, especially if you're a commercial grower, um, you may lose up to about 50% of the fruit you're going to have to chunk and not be able to sell because the peelings are going to be damaged. So um, for the most part, there's going to be a lot more damaged fruit um, probably on the market this year. The quality won't be as good. And then we also notice some of these fruit that are, um, that are damaged, a lot of bugs are starting to move in on them. Okay. A lot of times when these fruits start to ripen prematurely, you get insects like the leaf-footed plant bug 
or move in on those fruits. So you really need to be out there. And if you notice some stink bugs and some leaf-footed plant bugs, you need to be spraying with chemicals like malathion to try to prevent those fruit from being damaged. If you don't do that when you harvest them and you let the stink bugs take them, you're going to have a lot of dry slices inside. And of there's them. really nothing to do with fruit that's been dropped other than add it to your compost pile. Right. <laughs> it's, a great know, addition. it's a great addition to your compost pile. Unless you like to eat unripened fruit, <laughs> they're not going to be very sweet at this time of year. And that's another question we get a lot. Why aren't my satsumas ripe? Well, one thing is we haven't had any cold weather. We need cold weather or cool weather to get the, the sugars inside of these fruit, um, the starches to turn to sugar. And once we get some little cool snaps and we get a little frost, the quality of your citrus is going to improve remarkably. But right now, in this hot weather, you can expect that your fruit are going to stay pretty sour tasting. You'll get a little cool weather, the quality, you'll see a big improvement in the quality. Now, let's talk about some of the nasty little critters that came in with the hurricane. Well, we talked about um, this citrus leaf miner was one thing a, a few years back when Hurricane Andrew had come in. Um, we also worry about other things. Um, I know last year they had some hurricanes that came in and brought um, Asian soybean rust that um, we're kind of dealing with now. So sometimes we worry about down the road, we're really not too sure, but these hurricanes as they move through the Caribbean or they move through South America or some of these other areas, um, they'll bring with it a lot of pests um, that we that you know, we have to kind of get ready to deal with. So there may be some new things out there that next year we'll be talking about that these winds have blown in. But and, and we know for a fact that the mosquitoes came in. Right, the mosquitoes, and one thing with mosquitoes um, a lot of people don't realize is that, we've had a lot of calls on this, um, mosquitoes can lay eggs and those eggs can remain dormant sometimes for years and years and years. And so it seems like, you know, right after the, the hurricane, that will have a lot of mosquitoes blown in. Well, some of those are, are blowing in, but also a lot of the, the egg masses will float up, um, will get into a favorable moist environment, will hatch out, and within a couple of weeks, we'll be bombarded with a lot of these salt marsh mosquitoes. But um, the good thing is, I know like in Vermilion Parish and Lafayette Parish, they've been stepping up some of the spraying, and I find that that helps a lot. Um, and usually the life cycle on most of these mosquitoes are not real, real long, um, probably not more than a couple weeks. So with spraying, if we could get a little cooler weather, the weather pattern can change. Um, in most cases, um, you know, that we're going to get a little relief from the mosquitoes. But one thing we were mentioning, if you're going to be out in your yard, um, you want to make sure and um, spray yourself, especially the products that have um, DEET in them um, are quite effective at repelling uh, mosquitoes. Um, we, you know, one of the reasons I guess they're spraying a lot is we're worried about diseases like West Nile disease maybe becoming a bigger problem as people out in their yards cleaning up and getting bitten by these mosquitoes. Um, fire ants are another one. I know I was in my yard picking up shingles and for whatever reason, I think it's the warmth of the shingle and the black color. Every shingle I picked up had a nest of fire ants under it. Um, as long as it's warm like this, this is a good time to put out some bait. Um, Give us an example. Which um, bait? Examples of baits that work real well. There's one called Extinguish. There's one called Amdro, Logic, Over and Out. These baits are picked up by the workers. You disperse them over the whole, over your entire yard. Um, it's, it's at low use rates. Products like Amdro, it's only about a pound per acre. Um, you put them out over the whole yard. The workers um, bring them back to the queen. And um, that, that way the queen can be sterilized. And you do a much better job of controlling ants if you treat the entire area. Okay, so um, you're saying treat your entire right, treat yard the enti as, as opposed entire to Entire yard, and, but in addition to that, what they found is the best thing is to take a two-step approach. Put a bait over the entire yard as long as it's warm like this, and one way to check is to maybe put some potato chips or some hot dogs on the ground, come back in an hour. If you see fire ants on it, then the ants are out foraging. Once it starts cooling off, if you put out food on the ground and you don't see any ants on it within an hour or two, then the ants have already kind of shut down for the winter. They're in their colony. They're not going to be picking up any, any, any um, bait at that point. So you want to make sure they're out there. And from what I've seen, they're out there right now. Uh -huh. I would put out a bait within the next few days. And then in addition to that, for every mound that you see, I would do a spot treatment with a chemical like orthene, um, permethrin, something like that. Drench the mound with at least about a gallon of insecticide so that, that you, you really treat that entire mound. And realize for every mound that you see, some experts say that there's probably 250 little satellite mounds. So you think that you're treating that whole mound, but really um, that there's a lot of little mounds scattered throughout the yard that 
That's why a bait is going to be real effective because you're going to be treating those little mounds that you don't see. Now, we're covering a variety of topics. You know, we're sort of just skipping from one to one. The LSU Ag Center has available a wonderful pamphlet called Storm Recovery, a guide for homeowners. This is available in a booklet form. It can also be downloaded from the web. I know they've prepared, I read in the newspaper, over 100,000 copies of the, of, of the hard copy of it. It covers just about every topic that you might be interested in related to, to storm damage. Power outages, restoring storm damaged buildings, water damage to belongings, lawn, lawn and garden losses, which we're sort of talking about today, financial recovery, and risk management. It, it's just a very thorough little booklet. The Ag Center also has on their website little specific informational two-page summaries that you can download at your home. So, I mean, we're covering a lot of this information fairly, very rapidly, but for more in-depth information, do go to the LSU Ag Center website. Would you LSU give Ag Center com, And um, on that site, like Janae said, you can access this information, or if you want to call our office at 291-7090, we'll be happy to send you any of these publications. This is another little, um, you know, I was amazed at the variety of information that the LSU Ag Center had had prepared already on, on storm damage. Replacing important papers, your rights as a tenant, living on a reduced income, banking after a storm, uh, helping children cope with the disaster, credit for disaster victims, flood insurance, removing odors from your refrigerator and freezer. They have a very, very detailed section on this. Most people have probably already completed the actual removal of the food, but those odor problems are just such, such, such a challenge. They give three or four different methods to try and salvage your, your appliances. Uh, water damaged furniture, unemployment issues, homeowners insurance, you know, insurance claims after your disaster, con artists after the storm. I, I know one thing we, we started to talk about, they're, they're putting information on about term, uh, termites. Right, I know we got an email yesterday. Um, one thing they're concerned about, we have some areas of the state, like the New Orleans area and the Lake Charles area, that has a tremendous problem with Formosan termites. And um, they're afraid that there's going to be a lot of uh, wood that's going to be salvaged out of those areas. Um, people are going to, as these these areas, those homes are torn down or they're rebuilt. People are going to maybe try to recycle some of that wood. And um, they're afraid that if people bring a lot of this damaged wood in from the New Orleans or Lake Charles area, they may be bringing in some Formosan termites along with it. So my understanding is they've actually put a quarantine and, not, and they're not allowing wood from those areas to come in um, because that's how they're afraid that we're going to um, create a huge Formosan termite problem in other areas of the state where they're maybe not, um, not as bad yet. And the Formosan termite came into the country um, after World War II, actually came in with, they had used a lot of packing material um, when they were fighting the war in the South Pacific. And so they know that, you know, that's one of the ways that, that it can be transported real easily is through um, recycled wood. And we ought to, speaking of wood, sort of, in the, sort of in the area anyway. You know, this is an ideal opportunity. If you haven't made a compost pile now, you ha probably have readily available material in your yard. You know, everybody just has piles of, of storm debris. Start a compost pile using these, these dead leaves, and the small branches are great for aeration. There's, there's information, you know, readily available on starting a compost pile, but take the opportunity to do it while you've got the materials available now. You know, use your, your, your coffee grounds, just stuff that you have readily available in your home, your egg cells, you know, your citrus peels, and these oak leaves and the small branches are going to create a wonderful product. You can work your pile, make it happen faster, and you can pile it in a corner and leave it alone, and it's still going to compost. The only thing that's going to change is the time period that it takes. But this is a great opportunity to start a compost if you don't have a compost pile if you don't have one. We're getting some calls too. People are worried about, especially in Vermilion Parish and some of the areas that flooded with this salt water. 
you know, what, what's going to happen to these lawns or what's going to happen to these plants. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, nature's pretty resilient. In a lot of ways, um, you know, these plants are, in, in some cases, are going to be able to come back. And for lawns, for exa example, there's some grasses like Bermuda grass that are pretty salt tolerant. St. Augustine is also pretty salt tolerant. So if you, um, if you have some of those species growing in your yard and your yard flooded with salt water, chances are um, you're going to see a change makeup, maybe in the makeup up in your yard. Those, we, those grasses are going to be able to do a little better because the competition is going to have been killed out. So you may go to having a little more St. Augustine or a little more Bermuda in your lawn. Now what happens with salt once you get it in the soil? Um, it can be very toxic to some plants, but luckily it'll wash out of the soil. If we have a very wet winter, chances are by next spring, um, a lot of that salt will be washed out. And some people, um, some researchers have found that about 24 inches of rain will wash out about 90% of the soil, uh, salt out of the soil. So if we have a real rainy winter, like some years we'll have two feet of rain between now and the spring. It's going to wash a lot of that salt out. Plants can take being flooded. We're talking a little bit about citrus. Um, they've done studies on citrus. They've seen a lot of citrus flooding in Florida and other states. In some cases, citrus can flood for up to a couple weeks and still survive. There's some rootstocks, um, like this swingle rootstock that our citrus is grafted on. Um, it's a lot more salt tolerant. So if you have some citrus trees that flooded, they happen to be on a swingle rootstock, they're going to take a little more salt um, versus some of the rootstocks like trifoliata aren't quite as salt tolerant. Um, now, what, what advice would you give to Lafayette homeowners just about general lawn care? I mean, we haven't had salt well, water, but general... Yeah, some of the lawns look bad. There might have been a little flooding. Um, the lawns looked a little rough. We had a drought before this rain. We had some chinch bug problems. Um, the worst thing you could probably do right now is go out and fertilize your lawn. Because if you put nitrogen fertilizer on it and get it growing, and we're going to have some cool weather possibly this weekend in the next few weeks, you're really setting it up to develop um, brown patch disease. So even though your lawn doesn't look like that great, don't fertilize it. I have no doubt if you put fertilizer, you can get it to look great for, for a week or two. But then as the winter is going to go on, the fall is going to go on, you're going to have a lot of problems with brown patch fungus. And those are those big brown circles that mm -hmm. appear in centipede and St. Augustine lawns. So for the most part, all you'd want to do is maybe mow it a little higher than what you normally yes. do so that you don't stress it as much. And put out just a winterizer type fertilizer, something high in potassium. Murate of potash, which is 0060 at a rate of two pounds per thousand square feet, is a good treatment right now. It's not going to make the lawn grow. It's going to give it, um, boost its immune system, and it's going to build up its cold hardiness. Okay, when you say mow high, give inches. Yeah, probably mowing high, St. Augustine, you'd want to mow it at least about three inches. And especially in the shade, you may even want to go a little higher than that. Okay, so just, you know, don't overstress your yard, just like don't, don't overstress your plants. This is not the time to, not be, the time not to put the fertilizer, time to fertilize. On, on, on really on anything. Um, we're going to have a few fig trees I wanted to just mention quickly at our sale. If any of y'all are interested in figs, uh, we'll have a variety called Improve Celeste, which was a variety developed by LSU in the 50s. It tends to make more than one crop a year. makes a real nice quality fig, and we'll have some of those available at our plant and, sale. And you notice they do have little figs. These trees, they, they are bearing a little small crop. You can, you can pick one or two or three figs. Mm -hmm. They'll make a little crop, and that's one thing with the improved Celeste versus the regular old Celeste that a lot of people can. It makes a little nicer stem on it, a little pretty bell-shaped fruit, and it'll make more than, than one crop. It'll make successive crops. It'll make at least two, three crops most years. Okay, do not forget, let's repeat again, the name of the LSU Ag Center book, Storm Recovery the guide for homeowners, and there's also um, a selection, oh, okay, another one, After the Storm, a guide to help children cope with the psychological effects of a hurricane. If you get to the LSU Ag Center website, they'll have a, a wide variety um, of publications available for you to download, or you can ask for a hard copy. Do you have? Yeah, we have plenty of hard okay. copies. We're putting them out at um, a lot of the shelters, a lot of the relief areas, agencies in the um, Lafayette area and Vermilion Parish area. We put copies out, and um, but feel free to call our office. We'll be happy to happy to send you one because we know we have a lot of displaced people who maybe even you know watching the show here in Lafayette. Now and also remember that we're having a 
resale of the planned extravaganza this Saturday. It's going to be from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock. We do have still a wide variety of plants. You're planning on being there? I'm planning on being there. If, so if you have some questions about um, storm damage or um, your plants, um, feel free to come with your questions, even if you're not interested in buying some if plants. You, if you have a disease, if, you know, mm -hmm. bring a little selection of it in a Ziploc bag. Stuart will be there to answer your questions and any of the, of the other hurricane-related topics that we haven't covered. We really didn't get a chance to talk too much about tree selection but this is a good time to evaluate which trees go down in a hurricane and which trees do not. So um, I'm sure there are pamphlets available on that too. You, you might notice that the live oaks went down in great profusion and that's because they have a short lifespan. covered some topics. <laughs> I don't know either. That's why I just finally moved into the compost. Are they saying the no. Throw them in the brown bag. No. Throw them away. No. Throw them away. Put them in the compost well, pile. They, they won't get any sweeter. Some people like them.